Young Thomas Edison by Michael Dooling. Essential question: What important traits must an inventor have? Thomas Alva Edison was born in a little house in Milan, Ohio, on February eleventh, eighteen forty-seven, to Samuel and Nancy Edison. He was the youngest of seven children. Thomas, who was called Young Al by his family, lived in an era very different from ours. There was no electric light, no telephone, no radio or CD player, not even a movie theater. Thomas loved to experiment. In 1856, at the age of nine, he turned his family's cellar into a laboratory, complete with test tubes, beakers, and whatever chemicals he could buy. It was a mess. Bottles were everywhere. Young Al would mix one chemical after another, sometimes following the experiments in his chemistry book, sometimes not. A little of this. And a little of that, he used to mumble. His mother always encouraged him to ask questions, and he did. What is this? Why does that happen? How does it happen? A bout of scarlet fever left Al hard of hearing, which made school difficult. While Al asked many questions at home, he did not ask any at school. Instead, he spent his time there daydreaming about his next experiment. Al's mother, a former teacher, took him out of school after only three months. From then on, she taught him at home. Mrs. Edison made sure he received an excellent education. He read Shakespeare, the Bible, history, and much more. Over the next few years, he also studied the great inventors, such as Galileo. At age twelve, young Al decided to look for a job. He needed money to continue his experiments, so he went into business as a paper boy on the train that went from Port Huron, where the Edisons now lived, to Detroit, Michigan. Every morning at seven a.m. to ten a.m. Al sold newspapers. Then he spent all day at the Detroit Library, reading and dreaming about his next experiment. He planned to read every book in the library, starting with the last book on the shelf and working back to the first. At night, he took the train home and sold papers again. Eventually, with the permission of the conductor. Al set up a laboratory in the baggage car of the train. Soon, the young scientist was experimenting with everything: chemicals, gadgets, test tubes, beakers, doohickeys, and thingamajigs. Things were going well until one day, when the train made a sudden lurch, bottles, books, newspapers, candies, and fruits went flying, along with Al. A bottle of phosphorus burst into flames. Al scrambled to put out the flames, but they spread too fast. Soon, a very upset conductor rushed in. At the next stop, the conductor threw all of Al's things off the train, even him. Al had never been so disappointed in his life. He went home and set up his laboratory again with the encouragement of his mother. He continued to experiment and tinker with every gadget he could get his hands on. Usually, his experiments did not work, but he always kept trying. Before long, Al had another job. He was a night wire, a railroad telegraph operator in Stratford Junction, Canada. There was a lot to learn. For weeks, he soaked up all the information he could about telegraphy. Al learned Morse code and much more. He worked the 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift, often sleeping right in the station. He also set up his laboratory in the back room of the station so that he could experiment in his off hours. Apart from the occasional explosion, life was grand.
One of Al's duties as the operator was to send the signal six every hour on the hour to show the dispatcher at the next station that he was awake. But the long hours sometimes caught up with him, and he would fall asleep. So the scientist in him had an idea. Soon Al had invented a device that hooked the telegraphy key to a clock. When the hour struck, the minute hand of the clock sent the message six for him. It was a moment of pure genius, which quickly got him fired when his boss discovered he was sleeping on the job. For the next five years, young Edison traveled all over the South and Midwest from one telegraph job to another. He continued to try to find ways to improve the telegraph. At age twenty-one. He made his way to Boston, Massachusetts, and started using his first name, Thomas. He decided that he was going to be an inventor, and he set up his latest laboratory. He wanted to learn all he could about electrical forces. His first patented invention was the electrical vote recorder. Unfortunately, Congress did not like his invention, and he could not sell it. Over the years. Thomas's hearing had grown worse. By now, he was nearly deaf. This did not hamper his creative abilities, though. In fact, he thought it even helped him to concentrate because he was not distracted by noises. It created solitude where he could tune out the whole world and think. In 1869. Thomas moved to New York City, and then later established his laboratory in Newark, New Jersey. And then bad news came from home: his mother had died. Thomas, at twenty-four, was deeply saddened. For a long time, he could not even speak of her. He would miss her letters, her advice and encouragement. He owed everything to his mother. In 1876, Thomas moved his laboratory to Menlo Park, New Jersey. He invented the carbon transmitter, which amplified the human voice, making the telephone and microphone possible. He also invented a machine that talked, a phonograph. Shortly thereafter, Thomas invented an electric light bulb. He also discovered the principle of sound waves, which made the radio possible. In 1887. He moved his laboratory to West Orange, New Jersey, developing the motion picture and much more. At one point, he had 250 people working for him and 45 inventions going. Such strange, incredible inventions were coming out of his laboratory that people started to call Thomas the Wizard. He would live to be 84 years old and patent 1,093 inventions. Thomas would always remember his mother's encouraging words to ask questions: "What is this? Why does that happen? How does it happen?" هيا تعلم فالعلم خير معين وتقرب به إلى الله رب العالمين.